I think I'm seeing it this week and just knowing that there are so many incredible presentations and discussions and so on going on that every chance I get to peek into one of them, I learn something new and knowing even having this constant sense of FOMO is in some ways like a, a sign that I'm on the right track. I'm in the right field. I know that we all have our different missions and our different approaches and even definitions of OER, but we're, I think, very similarly minded in the causes for social justice and equity and seeing the different interventions as steps in the right direction. We are here in the OEG Voices studio for another podcast episode being held during Open Education Week. OEG Voices is the podcast we do at Open Education Global. Really, it's just to bring you the, the people and, and get to know them and their interests that are, that are behind the, the scenes and in front of the scenes, Open Education. This is part of a series that we're doing to bring you people that we've honored last, now it was August that the Open Education Awards for Excellence were announced during Open Education Week. We like to have these as live events where people can listen in as we record. We're really excited and honored uh, again to have in the studio Jen Rim Wetzler from Creative Commons, who got the Catalyst Award this year. And so Jen is really humble about this. But like, tell us what what that you know was like to find out, Jen Rim. Oh well, first, thank you so much for having me here. It's a total honor to be here and um, get the chance to chat with you. I was shocked. <laughs> I finally figured out who nominated me and um, cracked that mystery. But it was a delight to learn in the middle of a symposium we were holding in New York that I had a nomination. I think I learned it from Jonathan, actually. It was Jonathan and maybe a couple of other CC staff members. We were both finalists, and I didn't even realize that we were in the running. But that was an honor in itself. And then to actually get the award was shocking. I mean, I try not to, I guess I waffle. I, I try to think of awards as like, oh, that's lovely. For other people, but also I think of all the other people like Jonathan and and like so many others around the world that are equally deserving. So it, yeah, it was very special. Well, of course, and and it is earned, and and I'm not just saying that because it comes through when, when you um, see the things that people um, write about the the award winners and and the whole piece is that it comes from anybody in the community who says this person's work. You know, it means something to me. I kind of recast the, the Catalyst Award. I think it used to be called the su Support Specialist. And it was meant to sort of honor the people who are outside um, the usual kind of uh, recognizing of the, the educators and sort of like the leaders. Obviously, a lot of people out there who make open education happen, who are the, you know, the librarians and the, the faculty support people. And the, so I just kind of thought Catalyst was a little bit better descriptor and it certainly describes your work. So I, I, I like to ask like, uh, what, what part of the world did, did you grow up, Jenrin? And uh, what were you like as, as a student? What did you think of school as, as a kid? Oh man, um, I, so I mostly lived in the US. Um, all along the eastern seaboard, but also lived up in Canada for a little bit. Um, I was, I think, a yeah, a bit of a goody two shoes, like always wanting to get A's. Um, but I, I was pretty bad at math, I would say. Um, yeah, I fell in love with philosophy, and um, then once I got to live abroad a little bit more, I think I, I saw a whole another perspective on on education, like outside of this more kind of cerebral, logical experience of the world and um, something that was more, I think, all inclusive. The education that served me the most outside of some very specific, probably philosophy classes was like the Peace Corps and mm. living abroad and um, in some other places that really made a much more lasting impression. Can I ask where you were in the Peace Corps? Yeah, I was in Niger. Excellent. Right next to Nigeria. Before I was uh, given that position, I actually didn't know where to find it on a map. Thought it was Nigeria, but <laughs> yeah, Niger is a landlocked uh, West African country, mostly Muslim. Mm. Incredible country. And uh, for a lot of people, I ask about their entree to open education uh, because a lot of cases people are, you know, well, this project came along or a leader at my institution said we need to get involved with that. 
it wasn't like you walked through a door of open education, but like what, what was the sort of the path that led you into the work you're doing now at Creative Commons? So I was really lucky to be in a, a very quirky team in um, the State Department. I was part of the collaboratory, which was um, kind of like a, almost like a, I guess, innovation lab for um, for exchanges in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the State Department, trying to think of like different ways to um, to support our our cultural and our educational exchanges, such as the Fulbright Exchange and and so on, um, through you know virtual components and um, kind of rethinking through human centered design some of the ways that we create meaning um, across cultures. So anyway, it was a really fun team to be on. And I remember distinctly um, at one point, my boss mentioning something about the chance to get um, open education into this national action plan um, for for our work with the Open Government Partnership. And I I was just very curious to learn more. So we went on a, a walk around this pond and um, it was like kind of love at first sight when I first started learning about OER. I, I just wanted to learn more and more and more and then um, be a part of this this effort within the government. And then um, I started learning more about it beyond, you know, what what folks inside the government were trying to do. I got to meet with Cable Green and Nicole Allen and a bunch of other folks that were a part of it at the time. And it, it was the most meaningful project that I ever worked on at the State Department. Right. And, and people may not think of the role to place, the attention to open education w within government agencies. And so that's really important work. Yeah, I think a very sweet moment. And it was under the Obama administration. It was getting to work with the right people at the right time. And I guess taking advantage of a, a little window of opportunity that was definitely particular to that moment. But I, I expect more windows will open up. And I know there's a lot more open educational resource work going on. In the World Bureau. So working at Creative Commons, like, you know, you might think because th they've been around so long and there's this huge organization, they have like this big, shiny office building uh, somewhere down on the inner part of DC. Like, what is Creative Commons as a workplace? Like, how does it work? Just like that. It's just the shiny monolith of <laughs> <laughs> loads of people. Um, no, we are a very humble, small group of folks around the world, mostly in the US and Canada, that, um, yeah, that work from our home desks. So I, I want to say there's there are generally between 16 and 20 of us. Um, we're a little short staffed right now. Um, yeah, there's no like shiny monolith for Creative Commons. People expect it, that it's, you know, the size of the Wikimedia Foundation, for example, but we're a very small group. Um, and always trying to re-envision how to work together, how to work on new projects, how to continue to foster some of the things that we've, we're hoping to um, to foster with communities and so on. Yeah, obviously working like we do as a distributed organization, you were doing that already when the pandemic happened. Of course, it was like yeah. the horror of it and, and like <laughs> what's going to happen. But it's like, well, wait a minute. This is how I've been working all along. And so what has been the time since the lockdown been like in terms of um, continuing the work that you do in this mode? And I was incredibly lucky. Um, with that that period of time with you know being where i was and where i still am so yeah I, I fully i recognize people have had it way way worse i i lucked out in in that i had um two kids at the daycare age that um were relatively unfazed by the disruption um i was already working remotely so it was just um yeah work-wise i think it it had us rethink some of the work-life balance elements, which has actually been carried forward now. But beyond that, it didn't really change much. We had a project, at, I think, in the early stages of the pandemic to have this COVID pledge where companies would open their um, their IP to um, increase the likelihood of developing cures for COVID. So that was passed on to the um, to Washington School of Law, their PIDGIP program, and I, I'm always going to get this acronym wrong, but it's like the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property, I think. So anyway, that I think that was probably like the the one major project at the time that was really focused on on COVID. But beyond that, we tried to, yeah, ideally meet folks were where they were in this time of crisis. 
the work you you were um like I'm aware from the the award information. So like Genrin's like pie chart of works. What are the major pieces? Um, you know, I, I'd imagine the Creative Commons certification, but what what are the places that you're pouring your attention to these days? I love getting to still oversee some of the the certificate work, but I've largely passed that on um, at this point to my wonderful colleague, Shana Hollick. I oversee our training and learning efforts writ large and then our consulting efforts trying to use the the certificate kind of foundational learning and apply it in different contexts for different audiences and kind of reimagine it um, in different settings too. So one of the the things that we are really hoping to announce possibly today um, is this micro-credential program with the University of Nebraska Omaha, which um, came about through the certificate program. So this is one example of how the learning and training program finds, I guess, new partnerships and pathways to to keep bringing open licensing expertise to, to new communities. Beyond that, I, I get to focus on open journalism, which is so much fun, and it has a lot of parallels to our, our open education work. So working with journalists around the world who also want to expand access to knowledge and verified information, but who face huge and devastating odds right now with market failure um, and mis and disinformation and AI. A really interesting time. Going to journalists and saying there is an opportunity to share your news more efficiently with CC licensing or drawing from other news sources, CC licensed content and republishing it. That's really interesting. I, I actually had not even heard about <laughs> that as a quote unquote thing. So what is the incentive for open journalism? It ranges. So there are tons of outlets. Um, I think about 400 around the world that I know of, but I'm, I'm learning about more all the time um, that either CC license their content or use analogous permissions that have different incentives. So there's, um, let's see, like 360 Info that openly licenses all of their work on climate change as a better way to um, start to galvanize folks to address the sustainable development goals um, and climate change. There's um, the conversation or ProPublica um, that literally have, you know, taglines along the lines of like, steal our news. And they they use the republishing of CC licensed articles as an example of impact to their funders. They're able to go um, secure more funding based on their model that they can better share news, better collaborate with, with other um, academics in the, the conversations case um, and other news sources in ProPublica's case. Everything seems to be churning now in this field because, I don't know, it seems yeah. like every time I go to read a news story on a site, I have to go through a, a login or a subscription site. And yeah, eventually you can get to things. But like the idea of news and information being a public good feels like it's being eroded in some ways. There are still plenty of options to go to paywall-free sources, but they're facing extreme uh, economic hardship, this breakdown of their business model and, and so on with the, the former business model being based on ads. And now they're, you know, they, they haven't been able to compete with Ada and Google and so on. Sure. There are so many local news outlets that have had to close as a result. Ideally, this situation be, wouldn't be so dire, but at the same time, it, it might be a really telling time for news outlets and creative commons. It, I'm always heartened to see the different approaches to um, to resharing news these days. I, I've been working closely with a couple video journalists who train people in creating footage in their local environments to increase their the representation of more diverse voices in, in the news, and then CC license all of their content to basically drum up this, this trove of really wonderful B-roll or, or content that would um, help us kind of confront some of the stereotypes that we inadvertently come across. And when you search for a particular country and you see like the same kind of images come up, then you think, oh, this must be a war-torn country all the time. And there must be nothing else to reflect it, but they're doing incredible work to combat that. Are you also involved in running some of the CC networks? Um, yeah, the open education platform, which is, I think I will say the one platform that uh, 
has not had the the same level of grant funding, unfortunately, associated with it, but is still doing really incredible work. Thanks to Jonathan. Thanks to other folks um, in the the community that are just so inspiring. As of yesterday, just found out that our our budget for the year has been approved, and we'll have additional funds for the Open Education Platform community. So we'll get to continue. Yeah, a lot of the very minor <laughs> financial incentives that we can offer for some of the really wonderful collaborations and work that our platform community does. Yeah, can you give people listening an idea? I, I remember seeing the projects, like just some highlights for the things that were supported last year. Yeah, well, you know one of them very well, so I'll mention that one. And yeah. in, in particular, we were delighted to have the chance to work with with some librarians in Ukraine, as well as Paula Corti, who is a an OE Global community member as well. Paula's course on OER was offered as a movement in English, then translated into Ukrainian to meet the needs of local Ukrainian librarians during this really devastating time frame in, in Ukraine. So they wanted to use this one collaboration as an example of the power of OER as a connector across cultures, as um, something to open access to more education in a time of war, and as something to point to so other people know if it's possible here in this really challenging set of circumstances where people are losing access to electricity, where they have bomb sirens going off regularly, interrupting meetings and workflows and so on, if they can make it work in a place that's in the midst of war, then this kind of collaboration and translation and the cross-cultural understanding that goes with the translation can be done anywhere. So they did it. Absolutely. Do you have anything to add to that? A lot of it was that... Um... Like they were already involved in doing, uh, it wasn't like, oh, open education was new to the Ukrainian librarians. They, they were actively involved um, and, and they don't spend too much time dwelling on how bad things are. They really want to focus on what they can do. It's a very practical attitude that I think we can all learn a lot from. Yeah, absolutely. So what does it take to be a catalyst? No, but, uh, <laughs> That's unfair because I know you don't <laughs> set up in the morning and say like, I'm going to go out and catalyze today. but. You know, yeah. like, like, um, you know, what is it that fuels you, um, you know, about the work on a day to day basis? I think I'm seeing it this week and just knowing that there are so many incredible presentations and discussions and so on going on that every chance I get to peek into one of them, I learn something new and knowing even having this constant sense of FOMO is in some ways like a, a sign that I'm on the right track. I'm in the right field. I know that we all have our different missions and our different approaches and even definitions of OER, but we're, I think, very similarly minded in the causes for social justice and equity and seeing the different interventions as steps in the right direction. And yeah, I, I think just seeing what other people are doing, still learning, even though I've been in this field for quite a while now, is telling. I feel like I'm on the right track somewhere. I don't know where we're going, but I, I feel like it's so great to, yeah, feel excited about the people I get to work with and, and still learn from. I don't know if you want to read your quote, but Jonathan just put in the chat. He he goes, of course, it, it's from chemistry and it's a chemical which helps other reactions happen without being consumed itself. I always knew that the first part about, you know, catalysts and chemistry enabling other things to happen, but that's really a telling part about without being consumed itself because you can't be a catalyst otherwise. So yeah, the, chem the chemistry is in you, Jenny. <laughs> Yeah, I hope we don't get consumed by any one direction or another. I think if we can help others to um, to make those reactions happen, all the better. I mean, that's what the open education platform can serve as. You somewhat alluded to that what makes that work is like, okay, you don't have all the funding necessarily, but that um, really what fuels it are the people like the, the Jonathans. And I've heard that in, in several conversations today that... Um, you know, really what, what's enabling and gives us the hope and optimism for the future is that this is being human powered. Yeah. Um, and maybe, you know, I ask a lot of this, like, where are you on the um, the AI spectrum between angst and utopian optimism? Yeah. So, okay. Two points. One, I waffle every day. Um, and I, yeah, and I'll get back to that. The second point is, this this very conversation and the energy that we can get from 
a week like this, Open Education Week, where you see the importance and the power of that that human glue is, yeah, I guess it's not lost on me. I, I feel like all a lot of the conversations and uh, analysis around AI cannot capture the importance of the the kind of human to human connection that we have in striving towards our you know somewhat collective goals. We talk about the you know the dire threat to our climate and our future. We talk about the marginalization. We talk about, well, perpetuating already existing lines of marginalization of communities and power uses, power dynamics only um, intensifying and the mis and disinformation running rampant online and all of these like horrific things. And then we talk about the, the positives, like the incredible medical advances that are happening and now possible. None of that is including this kind of beautiful stickiness mm. of our kind of human connections and so on. Like I, I saw this really lovely um, message from Paula Corti for OE Global, just recognizing what everybody's doing, even behind the scenes. And that that kind of stuff gets lost in the, the larger conversation on AI. So going back to the waffling side of things, I've been in an ongoing conversation slash debate with Jonathan about AI. And I feel like at least for me, it's been very helpful. I've learned a, a whole lot. Um, I don't want to come from fear with everything. I, I, I want to come from a belief that we don't have all the answers and we can't know what's going to happen. But I, I have a serious pause when I see that, you know, Sam Altman's trying to raise $7 trillion for chip development. How are we, this small underfunded set of communities around the world in open education with not even a trillion dollars <laughs> among us, yeah. how can we expect that our interventions would have any kind of positive sway in this kind of larger scope that includes a very changing landscape and sometimes mm -hmm. a militarized landscape with AI? So yeah, I don't know. And this is also just me speaking of course, with my own musings. This is not any kind of official CC musings here. But yeah, I think we still have to try. I mean, we still have to ideally be a voice for the values that we've tried to live and try to support in, in our other projects in, in this new space. And we're not going to get it right all the time, but yeah, I think we still have to try. How many times a day like do you like get these requests of like, can I put a Creative Commons stuff or, or, or is, is this stuff from AI in the public domain? I understand people are looking how to navigate this and they want some clear rules. And you sort of have to say like the rules are in the process of being established and, and overturned. Um, but at least they're asking the, the question. I think that's a positive. Yeah, absolutely. I think we need more conversations about it. There are a lot of built-in assumptions that all of AI is chat GPT, for example, mm -hmm. or that everything under the sun falls under fair use. Um, or there's some secret magical way that CC licensed content has not been scraped offline, like all copyrighted content. Yeah. So I think we need more conversations, but I'd be curious to hear what Jonathan says. Cause, um, <laughs> I feel like we have a good counterbalancing of ideas on this. I would think, but yeah. you tell me what you think, Jonathan. Can I evade your question? Can I just brag for a second about Jenrin because. She Absolutely. doesn't brag enough about herself. I mean, it has been my privilege to work for her as a facilitator of this Creative Commons certificate. And I think that um, I'll get back to the AI connection in just a second, but that, uh, you know, that she d does this a, a little bit like Maha Bali. I, I keep going to your meetings, Alan, of where people I really admire are, are your are your guests. And, and you ask Maha, how is she so good at involving her audience and getting people to work? There's something about a Maha thing that is just amazing. And Jenrin is very similar. I'm maybe more behind the scenes. I mean, I haven't seen as many keynotes you've done, Jenrin. I saw, I saw one recently, which was fabulous. But there's a thing that, I, that we had meetings, periodic meetings during the time that I've facilitated Creative Commons certificate courses. And Jenrin is incredibly good at making everyone feel valued, being supported, listened to, get what they need, kind of, you know, encouraged to do things on time and do the things that they have to do. But also, you know, when you're having a tough time, she's super supportive of you and the thing that here's my connection to AI. My wife was telling me the other day, Jonathan, you're a bit of an asshole sometimes about things you care too much about. <laughs> and I feel like Jenrin could have, you know, could have like kind of said the hell with this guy. I don't want to deal with him anymore. He's really annoying on certain topics, but she has been sort of supportive and has been able to listen. And I have learned how to talk better about things by the conversations we've had. So 
I don't know. You're, you're incredibly good at doing this stuff, Jenna. You know, like Alan asked Mama, how do you do this? And I've worked in so many groups with so many bosses. You've been my boss for the, the facilitation. I don't know how you, how to be a good boss and you do, and, and how to make a team work so well. I don't know if you can say something about that. I think that's a much more interesting than, than my tired repetition of things I find problematic about AI. Thanks. That was um, the best evasion of a question I've ever heard. <laughs> uh, yeah. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, the certificate programs, a, a really sweet program. Um, we got to handpick the best facilitators, you know, around the world from Greece and Bangladesh and South Africa and Kenya and the U S and Italy and, you know, all over, um, one, it's just been, it's a total joy to work with like really good people and to get to learn from them. I mean, every semester there's something new that comes up and, um, yeah, I owe you a, a long Slack message about the latest one about, um, the machine readable code anyway. Um, so yeah, working with really wonderful people is just, that's, that's like the best part of my job period. Um, yeah. And then I think also just learning from maybe some past experiences that I've had, um, that didn't work for me as, as a worker, like that didn't bring out my, you know, my best, um, that's been helpful. So yeah, leaving room for people's own, um, personality to come out trusting that they're there for the right reasons they're going to do a good job and that like everybody else there yeah that we all need support and it's not like in one of my first jobs it's not a competition it's not something that you have to um yeah always prove yourself at or anything I, I remember yeah in one of my first jobs we were literally pitted against our coworkers and told to compete on things. <laughs> we were told to like, not let the boss know if we needed to go out for a lunch break, to like literally take a break in the middle of the day of, of working. There are so many things that didn't bring out my best. I, I feel like I need to always try to find new ways to solicit feedback, find ways to bring out people's best, and then just I, let them out of the way. <laughs> I, I have to admit in, in asking that of both Maha and you, it's an unfair question. Like you, you can't really break down how you do the, it's basically how you operate and it's evolved through your, your life experience. Uh, my, my own feeling is, is it comes from your, your care and passion for the work you believe in this work you're doing. It sounds really simple, but you couldn't really operate like that. If like your whole heart and, and, and real spirit was, was not into that work. Otherwise you're just kind of performing. Uh, and then also like, you know, and this is why, this is why I like having these conversations with you, Jonathan. We have to butt heads. Like if we're just, if we're all in agreement, like we don't get anywhere. And so we have to have places where we can, we can disagree. Um, and, and I, I aim for those places. I don't want to avoid them. Yeah. Our, our certificate program in particular, I think its strength is in being built to take in more of that feedback and more of that, more of those kind of contentious, challenging ideas to make it better. So I think the best thing that we can do is support those challenges. And I have to tell you, I, I notice like all the time, cause you know, I, I get a lot of emails and I actually like, I had this thing. I, I look at the footers, the signatures in people's email. Cause you, you find interesting things about them. And like, I'm not surprised all the time when I see people have that creative Commons certificate logo in, in their footer. And you know, the most recent was from Shishuna Rao from India, who was part of some of our programs. And I think she said somewhere that she paid for this on her own because she believed in it so much. And so that says a lot to what this program means. That's lovely. Thank you. Okay. So I don't have a trillion dollars, but I still have this toonie that I own. <laughs> <laughs> One day I'll either hand it to you or I'll, I'll get it in the mail. Yeah, no, no pressure. <laughs> I just like to also ask outside of um, all the work you do, like what are the things in your life that rejuvenate you or, or give you some energy that you do away from the creative commons time? Yeah. I train with a power lifter. I am certainly not a power lifter myself, but I have a really wonderful neighbor who has a, a gym down the street. It's just this very empowering women's space primarily, although there's some men who join too, that um, I never expected to really 
get into. Um, but after some like health issues, I was I was able to kind of really get into this. So I love weightlifting now. <laughs> or I thought I'd say that. Weightlifting and then Mom Fight Club. So Mom Fight Club is similar, but it's with like a bunch of moms in my neighborhood that um, basically are doing CrossFit and, and recovering from partum and so on. Um, that's really fun. Also, occasionally teaching yoga to neighbors is, is really fun. I used to teach yoga all the time and, and miss it. But um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's a really sweet community here in Mount Rainier, Maryland. So getting to know folks through some of the, the physical activity and, and some activism stuff, but mostly, mostly pumping iron. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go. I'm, I'm going to be inspired by that uh, powerlifting. Uh, I just can't thank you enough for taking the time. I get the most out of these because I, I get to have these conversations with people. And, and thank you, Jonathan for being my audience twice now, but uh, I end up like getting so deeply when I'm editing my podcast. I'm like, oh, I just, I'm listening again to go through it that um, closely. You just get so much more out of it. So yeah. I really appreciate it, Jen. And uh, we just appreciate all the work that you do. Thank you for making this possible. It's very kind. Hey, you've gotten to the end of this episode, which is a new episode of OE Global Voices, the podcast produced by Open Education Global where we featured a conversation with last year's Open Education Award for Excellence, the winner in the Catalyst category, Jenrin Wetzler. This was recorded live on March 7, 2024. Wow, that was a while ago, as an event during Open Education Week. And we again appreciate our guest in the studio for both of these sessions, Jonathan Poritz. We ask that you start thinking about a person, project, or resource worth nominating for the 2024 Open Education Awards as nominations open soon, May 13th. But you can find the information now about the awards program and start thinking about who or what you might nominate by going to our website at awards.oeglobal.org. Each episode of OE Global Voices features a different musical track that we select from the Free Music Archive. I was fortunate to find several tracks with Catalyst in their title. The one I picked was called Catalyst by Anemia. Anemoya. I don't know if I'm pronouncing the artist's name correctly, excuse me, but it's licensed under an attribution, non commercial, share like international license. Appropriately, it's Creative Commons for Genren and for everybody else. So you can find this episode at our website, voices.oeglobal.org. You can find it many other places. You find podcasts like YouTube, and I think it's on Spotify. I think it's on Apple and a couple others. Uh, you can also ask some questions about what you heard in today's episode or share your comments with Genren in our OEG Connect community. You can find that at connect.oeglobal.org. And anyone out there listening, we're looking for more voices to share. The podcast studio is open. Or if you want to suggest a future guest, please just let us know. You can find contacts on our website. You can email us. Or you can just shout out the window. I want to be on your show. Maybe I'll hear you. Again, come back for our next episode. We got a lot more exciting ones coming up.